On this episode of the Pinstripe Talk podcast, we have a very special guest I would like to welcome to the show, New York Times bestselling author John Pesha. John, how are you doing today? Good, Nick. How are you there in New Jersey? I'm doing great. How's everything in regards to everything going on in the world? Uh, how are you holding up? Well, uh, we live in Long Island and um, 28,000 cases in my county. So uh, I've been out to the store twice since uh, we really locked down on March 14th. Um, so it's uh, we're waiting, you know, we're listening to our governor and we're we're waiting it out. That's really all we can do at this point. But you had released a great book uh, that, like I mentioned before we came on, that I was absolutely riveted by. It's called Yogi, A Life Behind the Mask. And the book is about the great Yogi Berra, the late great Yogi Berra. And it's just a book that it's extensive. You go through it. There's just so much to learn about Yogi that I didn't even know. And I worked for the New Jersey Jackals for all of four years. And being at Yogi Bear's museum and, and going there on a weekly basis to, to learn about him, the book really takes you more in depth into the backstory of his life that you really wouldn't know about. Well, thanks so much, Nick. I'll tell you what, I mean, I spent four and a half years uh, researching and, and writing the book, talked to about you know 150 people, and you always look for what I, I call guides. And, um, you know, you find, you know, for something this extensive, you know, hopefully about a dozen people in different walks of his life, and you ask them to, uh, to stay with you through the project. And luckily, I found um, a lot of people who were willing to do that. Um, my favorite, uh, among favorites, was uh, probably Bonnie Morris, who was Carmen Vera's uh, sister. Uh, lived with her when she met, um, when Carmen met Yogi, and she told me how she stopped, uh, Carmen stopped dating all the college hunks, as she put it, um, and and just fell instantly in love with this um, interesting, unique uh, man. And uh, so that's, you know, a lot of research, a lot of reading of the sporting news back in those days, which was considered the Bible of baseball. And, um, you know, I, I was surprised myself. I caught Yogi at the tail end of his career in 1960. He was my father's favorite player, and my father told me what a dynamic player he was. Um, so I really wanted to go back and see that part of it. But he led just a, such a, as you said, such a full life, you know, starting, you know, as a kid growing up in the Italian section of St. Louis in the Depression, through World Wars, through the growth of suburbs and television where he became a star, uh, off the field, through the Yogi Berra Museum, um, right into, the, you know, right into the end of his life, he was still doing things and people still, you know, wanted him to be around him. He was definitely a huge figure in the world, and especially growing up uh, in the early 90s. That was what I was taught, you know, as a, as a fan of the Yankees. Right. He was a, a mainstay in the organization. Yeah, I mean, he was, you know, his, in 1948 um, was his second year in baseball, and his manager, um, and we'll get to the whole verbal abuse part of this a little, a little later, but his manager, Bucky Harris, uh, who loved him, um, predicted that Yogi Berra one day, he says, I know all about DiMaggio, who was still on the team then. I know all about Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, but this kid, this kid's going to become the most beloved Yankee of all time. And he saw it and he was, he was spot on. I mean, you know, you go to old, one of the interesting things is you go to old timers games and not only does Yogi, Yogi get a huge ovation when he came out after he came back to the Yankees with the apology from George, but uh, inside the stadium, all of the players um, from every decade would surround Yogi. When Yogi walked into the room or the later years when he's wheeled in on his wheelchair, everything stopped. And, you know, uh, everyone wanted to talk to Yogi. I mean, he was just that kind of, you know, there's a handful of special people that you meet during your life. And, and, and he was definitely one of them. Oh, absolutely. And you mentioned how long it took to write the book and how many sources that you used for the book uh, as well. What were some of the challenges that you found while you were going through this process, if any? Uh, there, there were certainly a lot of challenges. I mean, my first book was from 1990 to um, uh, basically the Bud Selig era. Well, I was alive during then, and I covered it, so I had a great familiarity with the subject. This book starts in 1925, you know, well before I was born, you know, quarter of a century before I was born. Um, and, you know, to get the understanding of what it's like to go through a depression, which hopefully we won't experience now, um, you know, and then a world war um, and what life was like and what was like 
life like growing up as, as an Italian um, in, in that era, which I didn't understand. I didn't know how deep the, the discrimination against Italians were in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, so, you know, being able to find people and people of his, his contemporaries, I mean, Yogi passed away in 2015 at age 90. So to find his contemporaries, which thankfully I did, there were three wonderful gentlemen um, on the hill, three friends who literally grew up with Yogi, played ball with him, lived on the same street as him. Um, so knew uh, just intimate details that I hadn't read anywhere before. And, um, you know, finding those people and, and, you know, developing relations with those people takes a lot of time. And, you know, if you, I've read every book now written about yogi and there's usually two to three different versions of most of the famous stories and some of them by yogi himself and you know to find out okay so which version if any of these are true you know you need to cross check that across any number of sources um takes a lot of time and, and patience but this was just so interesting that I, I didn't mind my publisher would have liked me to get done a little faster but it takes a long time to be able to get a comprehensive book from someone who lived 90 very full years, like Yogi did. Oh, yeah, and there's so many different aspects you could cover from it in regards to his life that it I, I can imagine it took that long just to make sure you got all those stories correct or to the most uh, accurate story that you could find. Absolutely. I mean, you know, rule of thumb, two to three sources on every story – this took a little bit more because there were so many different versions of so many stories and and uh, and and finding again finding the people who were really there who could tell you okay this is really what happened um, time consuming but I've had a, a you know one of the great things about this job is you meet so many interesting people I mean Yogi was a fascinating subject and a lot of the people along the way um, you know like his sister in law like his son Larry who I know has business in, in the town that you're in. Um, you know, they, they themselves are stories onto themselves. So it was really, um, I enjoy doing this. So, and I enjoy talking and, you know, so this was the fact that it took this long. My publisher, like I said, would have liked it, but I didn't mind. Now you mentioned interesting people you got to talk to over the process. Go into Yogi's family a little bit. Uh, you mentioned Larry, who we had a conversation, had a business actually in the town that I reside in. Uh, how much of an influence did some of his relatives have on this book? Well, I mean, I knew um, Lindsay, his oldest um, granddaughter, I've known for years. I was one of um, the team of people that um, uh, that hired her at ESPN Magazine. And we were the only people, I think, in the world who liked peeps, um, those, <laughs> those little marshmallows that come out during the Easter. And uh, so she would always buy them at, at Easter, and we were the only people in the big open newsroom who would eat the peeps. Um, so I, I've known her for a long time, um, and she was she was uh, very helpful in the beginning of this book. Um, had a really interesting uh, sit down with with Larry Barra um, in an Italian restaurant not far from where you are, um, and uh, we talked for three three and a half hours. And I think the thing that really struck me the most was when he was eighteen. He was all state catcher in New Jersey, and he wanted, and he could have, you know, he wanted to apply for the draft. And back then, you had to be 21 or get parental uh, permission to apply for the baseball draft. And Carmen wouldn't give him permission, uh, which kind of echoes Yogi's life because his Yogi's father um, didn't let Yogi's three older brothers, all of whom were were top baseball prospects, and Yogi, who was dying day, said that. Um, Tony, the oldest of the brothers, was the best baseball player in the family, which is phenomenal if, if, if true. And he really, his brothers went to bat for him. He almost wasn't allowed to stick in baseball, um, which would have deprived us of Yogi Berra. And uh, so Larry wasn't, you know, he wanted to go uh, apply for the draft. Um, Carmen said, no, I want you to go to college. He went to Montclair State. Um, and the minute he turned 21, he applied for the draft. Um, you know, the Mets signed him as a, as a as a free agent, and I think the 10th game of his career on a pop fly, he told me that he and the pitcher went for it, the ground was wet, um, the pitcher stopped, slid, wrecked his knees, and that was the end of his baseball career, which was too bad. It's unbelievable, and, and you mentioned that was one of the interesting stories that I found, was that Yogi's father was said dead against him actually pursuing his baseball career. 
and his older brothers had the same story, imagine if his father didn't let him pursue that. We wouldn't have this story today. Right. I mean, and it was very close. There were two, I wrote about them, there were two family meetings. Um, and when I say family meetings, it also included the, the, the parish priest, which was like the beating heart of that community was the church. Um, his mother went to church every day at 5.30 in the morning before she went shopping for, uh, for, for the family of, of four boys and, her, and, and, a, and a daughter. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the older brothers were told no. I mean, the oldest, Tony, um, the Cleveland Indians wanted to sign him. And, and as father said, um, you're a man now, uh, games are for boys, and you go to work. So he, he worked in a bakery his whole life. His, um, his brother Mike worked in a women's shoe factory his whole life. His brother John uh, worked at a, as a waiter in a restaurant until Yogi um, brought him east to um, help run the um, bowling alley that him and Phil Rizzuto built in Clifton. Um, so they, you know, weren't able to uh, to live their dream, and they, you know, stuck up for Yogi and said, "Look, you know, we'll get extra shifts. The pressure was starting to near an end. We'll get extra shifts. We'll bring in the money that that you want, you know, Yogi to bring in. Let's see if he can do it." And one of the interesting things is they so much believed in Yogi that they said, "Okay, if you um, you're a right-handed hitter, um, switch to be left-handed." because left-handers have a better chance of making it to the major leagues. So this is Yogi at like seven, eight years old, and he just switched to the left side and became a left-handed hitter like nothing. And that's how athletic he was. So Yogi actually was a true right-handed hitter. Yeah, so that was a really, that's really interesting as well. Like he just had the ability to just pick it up and, and do it. So a lot of things that a lot of people, like, like myself, I sure as heck couldn't hit from the left side of the plate if I tried, you know. I could hit from the right side a little bit, but... Left side, I definitely wouldn't be able to. <laughs> well, you know, um, Joe Garagiola, who grew up across the street from from him in St. Louis, um, Joe's father and Yogi's father were, were both friends in Italy. They both came over to America about a year apart, both ended up settling in St. Louis and living literally across the street from each other. And, you know, Joe was fond of saying that he didn't know it. Uh, there wasn't a day in his life where he didn't know Yogi Berra. And, um, and he said, no matter what sport, you know, uh, Yogi was always the best kid on whatever sport that he played. And instantly, there's a little story in the in, in, the, in the book um, that said, you know, Yogi had never played ping pong before. And they just walked into the Y, which was a mile walk from, from where they lived. And there was a tournament going on. And Yogi um, picked up the, the, the paddle for the first time and reached the finals. Um, so he was just a natural athlete with incredible hand-eye coordination. I think that was a a real key to his success. Now, you mentioned Joe Garagiola, his best friend growing up, and the two basically went on their baseball career paths together, but they went on different routes. Kind of elaborate on that uh, for a little bit. Yeah, you know, um, they played on a lot of uh, neighborhood teams together. Um, Joe was a year younger than, than Yogi, um, and so, you know, one would pitch, one would catch, one would be, you know, hit third, one would hit fourth. Um, Joe always insisted that, you know, Joe was a good player, made it to the major leagues, you got to be good. Um, but always insisted that Yogi was the better player. Um, there was a big tryout when uh, Joe was 15, Yogi was 16 at the old Sportsman's Park. A couple of thousand kids show up from you know, because answering an ad in the paper to say, try out for the St. Louis Cardinals. The general manager of the St. Louis Cardinals was Branch Rickey, you know, universally recognized as the best talent judge in the game. And one of uh, Ricky's true talents in baseball, as we know, first-round draft tries a lot of times never make it. It's hard to project an 18-year-old what he's going to be able to do when he's when he's older. And Ricky supposedly had a talent of being able to look at a kid and project what he was going to look like and be like as an adult and and, and as a baseball player. Well, Joe Garagiola looked like the prototype baseball player, six foot one, 180 pounds, uh, strong, fast, and could hit. And he was a good player. Um, and they both, Yogi and Joe, both played catcher. Well, at this tryout, Red Shane Dean, the Hall of Fame second baseman, told me the story um, that it came down to eight players um, Joe Garagiola, Yogi Berra, Red Shane Dean, some five people who didn't make it, they didn't remember. But what he did remember was it was just the eight of them drove off to a private park. 
and worked out in front of Ricky and the scouts and um, uh, read pitch to, uh, to Yogi and he said, I couldn't get anything past him. Even if it was a foot outside, I couldn't get anything past him. And he said, uh, and this is a guy who's 90 years old now, remembering something that happened, you know, 60 some odd, almost 70 years ago, saying, I can still remember the sound that bat of the ball hitting that bat. I'd never heard anything like it. This kid was the best hitter I ever saw. And uh, he convinced everyone but Brent Ricky, who told him to his face he was never going to be more than a triple A player. Um, and he was telling this him for his own good. And that, that the only thing he was interested in was um, people who would go all the way. So he wasn't going to sign. And Joe Garagiola became uh, part of the Cardinal organization. Yogi played uh, two years of American Legion ball. Um, reached the finals, national finals twice, got the nickname Yogi during his time in the American Legion. And the head of the American Legion in St. Louis knew the Yankee general manager, sent him a telegram, said, I got a kid here who does everything wrong, but it all turns out right. All it'll take is a $500 bonus to sign him, and he's yours. And that's how he became Yankee, and, and that's how the, the two careers split right there. It's crazy. We talked about how what if his father said no to him pursuing baseball, but imagine if the Cardinals would have signed him, how the story would have been different. Oh, absolutely. Well, for one thing, we wouldn't, I mean, small in, in the greater picture of it, but he wouldn't be Yogi Berra. He'd be Larry Berra. Um, he'd probably be an outfielder because for the first two years of his professional career, he split his time between the catching and, and outfield. And he was, his own admission, a terrible catcher. And in fact, at the end of the 48th season, all the baseball writers and the sporting news and New York wrote that he was going to be a uh, the starting right fielder for the Yankees in 1949, and that um, and that Yogi was happy about it because he didn't like catching either. And then they fire um, Bucky Harris, who only had won uh, the World Series and come in second in his two years as manager, but he got into an argument with George Weiss. He got fired. They hired Casey Stengel. Stengel brings in a Hall of Fame catcher, um, Bill Dickey, to work with Yogi. As Yogi said, he learned me uh, his experience. Um, and um, he straightened out all the mechanical problems that Yogi was having and let Yogi's natural ability come through. And by the end of spring training, of working two hours every day after practice with him, he, he told everyone, this kid's not just going to be um, a good catcher. He's going to be the best catcher in baseball. And it was true. And now a lot of people have that. I don't even want to say a false understanding, but a lot of people don't realize how many hardships Farrah did go through uh, during his life uh, just to get to the point where he was uh, at the date of his death. You know, he first of all, he grew up in the Great Depression. That, that for one, is a tough time. Uh, then his father against him playing baseball or pursuing baseball – and then you fast forward a couple of years to the war, and he goes, he gets enlisted. And I have to tell you, I, when I'm reading that section of the book, I felt as if I was standing next to Yogi. Like, that's how vivid it was in that firsthand type of perspective. Well, thanks. I mean, I write the whole book. The book is written as a novel style, but, um, but it's factual. So there's no quotes per se. It's all scenes and dialogue. So, you know, basically I'm hoping that people, um, I'm a big advocate of, of show, don't tell, that people, you know, feel like they're in the room or feel like they're on the field or in this case feel like they're in the war with Yogi. And um, that was a, you know, a lot of research went into um, that because, you know, thankfully I didn't, lived through the, the world war like, like he did um 18 years old you know um that's uh unfathomable to me you know that and he was in a in a, in a small landing craft that was on the edge of the you know leading edge of the invasion of normandy uh saw things that you never want to see i mean most world war ii veterans um they don't you know they don't talk about their experiences and i mean he saw and did things that he didn't want to remember and there was a a scene and I don't believe it made it into a book because I actually had to cut about 60 pages out of the book before I turned it in. But there was a, when he, before the museum opened, a veterans group in New Jersey came to, to give Yogi a plaque and they walk into the, into the uh, lobby and Yogi comes walking out and no words are exchanged. And there's like a dozen veterans and Yogi and they all just start crying because all of the 
things that they had buried so deep in, in, you know, in the recesses of their mind that they never wanted to remember again. All once they saw each other and knew they all shared the common background, all of it just came flooding out, and um, and they were just overcome by emotion. And that's kind of the way I try to write that. I mean, when I write, I I, I kind of like feel like I need to be there, you know. So I feel like I'm on I'm on the beach and I'm seeing what he's seeing and feeling what he's feeling, and I was terrifying to go through uh for me so i can't imagine really going through it like like he did oh i could echo that I, when i was reading that section i felt like as if i was right there with him and it was terrifying and i'm sure for uh people of his age and the people who battled in that war they felt that same way but it was always that baseball seemed to be his his getaway it, it, even throughout the book it, it felt as if yeah he was battling in a war he was battling for his life but Baseball was still that common ground, and that was what he was determined to still do. Yo, I mean, Carmen uh, Barra did an interview in 1957, um, which I used in the book, and uh, in which she said that, you know, Yogi is happiest when he's on a baseball field or in a baseball locker room, definitely in uniform. I mean, that's what he was born to do. That's what he always wanted to do. He wasn't much of a student. He, you know, it's not like that he wasn't smart. He just wanted to play baseball that was and hey you know uh, i i was crushed at 18 that i didn't get to play major league baseball and baseball has always been um a huge part of, of of my life and the fact that i'm not listening to baseball games now i mean there's a internal clock you know starting in february i i know that i'm going to be listening and watching to um spring training games um, and then reading about it, and it's always on. I mean, whether I'm watching it or not, it's always on in the background. It's the background music of, of the summer, and it's missing right now. And I think, you know, Yogi had that. I mean, Yogi didn't get out of uniform until he was 64 years old. I mean, he was a, a, a player, right to a manager, a coach, you know, manager two more times, a coach, um, until he was 64 years old and, and hung it up after 1989 with the, with the Astros. And that was really hard for him. Yeah, you because know, that was his life. Oh yeah, and for something you do for so long, it, it kind of just it becomes part of you. Now, bringing up his playing career, let's get into when he comes back from the war and he actually signs with the Yankees. One thing that I didn't know, and after reading the book, I was amazed by it. You see all the names that the Yankees have. You know, you could go back to the Babe Ruths, the Lou Gehrigs, the Joe DiMaggio's, the Mickey Mantles, but. For a very a long period in Yankee history, it wasn't DiMaggio who was the man. It wasn't Manto who was the, the top guy. It was actually Yogi. Yeah, this is the player that my father told me about and that I didn't know. I mean, you know, every, I'm a baby boomer. We all grew up in, in the New York area, you know, dreaming about playing or being Mickey Mantle. You know, we all heard the stories of Joe DiMaggio, who was probably the most famous man in America. Uh, when during his playing days, um, both uh, of them cast huge shadows, and I think also Yogi's persona uh, overshadowed a lot of what he did on the playing field. And you go back and you look, and you know, 1949 to 1953, the Yankees won five straight um, championships. No one has ever done that. No one before. No one since. I doubt anyone will ever do that. And um, the it was at the end of DiMaggio's career. He was injured most of 49. Um, he got a 263 in 1950. Um, he had one good year, uh, excuse me, 51, and one good year in 50. But Yogi had probably the best year of his career and was definitely the guy on that team. Uh, Mantle was 19 years old in 1951. Um, and Yogi took him under his wing because um, there was a lot of pressure on Mantle. He was booed unmercifully and struck out a lot. And the guy who was the best player on that team, 20 home runs, 100 RBIs, 290 to 322 batting average every year, uh, and catching uh, an average of 141 out of 154 games was Yogi Berra. I mean, he dominated a good five, six years of, of baseball. And I mean, and he didn't get into the Hall of Fame until the second ballot, which is unfathomable as well. It's crazy to think that it took him two ballots to get in you would think exactly. for sure he'd be a first uh, first ballot hall of famer before we get into mantle that's a topic i want to get into and you mentioned it a little bit but i want to talk about the ridicule that yogi received and it, it just seems like he got harassed and bullied every which way uh, throughout his career you know we know 
uh, Yogi from the last, you know, a lot from the last 25 years of her career where he was a national treasure. And you would never imagine people harassing or verbally abusing Yogi. But uh, when uh, when he came into the into baseball, his very first manager in, the, in, in Norfolk, Virginia, um, in the Piedmont League and minor league stadiums, as you know, working with the Jackals, the, the stands are really close. And Yogi was a terrific player right from the get go. And he just got all sorts of verbal abuse about his looks um, and a lot about uh, his heritage. And like I said, um, in the 40s, especially during the war, Italians were not looked at fondly. And his, and the manager came to him and said, look, you're going to get a lot. You're really good. You're going to get a lot of, of this. And if you let it get to you, um, then you're just going to get it worse. But, you know, it stayed right through writers. Um, wrote about him as Quasimodo, Nature Boy, the ape. Um, his own manager, who loved him, you know, uh, Bucky Harris, the first manager, two writers would call him the ape, like thinking about, okay, so Joe DiMaggio in, in 47 is is hurt a lot of the uh, a lot of season, and he goes, you think the ape can bat fourth? I think he can do it. I mean, can you imagine a, a manager talking about a player today in those ways? But um, he faced that all the way through and a lot of a lot of you know because he was funny um said funny things uh, occasionally um you know uh, he, he was perceived not to be very smart and you know that followed him all the way through to the last managing assignment in the, into the 80s with the with the yankees um and it's amazing that you know you face that kind of abuse a lot of people would turn bitter um and i don't think anyone um who ever met yogi would describe yogi as a bitter man yogi was just a happy to be alive um enjoy life type of person oh for sure from the book you could see a, a lot of it he let roll off his back and i think that if it happened in this day and age with the media and everything it would be a it'd be a very hard thing for people to do because of all the media coverage and a guy like him would have attracted that kind of coverage right and i think you know he in the public it did roll off his back but um it hurt it hurt him it hurt his wife i think it was uh he mentioned it first page of, of his autobiography in 1960 was the two yogis the one that was ridiculed for and, and caricature and he says i don't know that yogi and then described the great baseball player good businessman good family man that's the yogi i know um very first page and when he was 36 years old of his autobiography um and um he, you know, I think that was a big reason why he really, really wanted to keep managing and, and win a, a, a title. Not just the fact that he wanted to win a title. Everyone in baseball wants to win a title. But I think part of it was he wanted to prove to everybody that, you know, he wasn't uh, the caricature. He wasn't the, you know, the, the uh, illiterate, dumb person that he was made out to be, especially early in his career. So I think that was a real... Um, driving force in, in him wanting to manage. Oh, yeah. And now, before we, we go into more Yogi topics, I have a, a question for you about Mickey Mantle. We mentioned that Mantle got booed, and the, the Yankee fans were hard on him. Do you think it was due to production, or do you think there's more behind it? Because, let's face it, Mantle was arguably the best player on, on a lot of those Yankee teams uh, past Yogi you had him around a long time but it just didn't seem like he lived up to the hype that everybody had around him well the Yankees did a great disfavor um to uh mantle they portrayed him as the next um joe dimaggio um you know one of the things that fascinated me in this research was yogi's relationship with joe and and who joe was and joe was as i said i mean he was married Mara Monroe. He was the, the I mean, how many people get uh, Ernest Hemingway to write a book, a story about him? You know, the old man in the sea was about Joe DiMaggio. And, um, uh, you know, they, they build him as the, as, as the next Joe DiMaggio. And everyone thought, all the players thought that Joe DiMaggio was the perfect player. He never did anything wrong. Made it look easy too. And, that's really hard for anyone to live up to. And, and Mandel in his very first year, 1951, in a, in a, I think it was game six of the 1951 World Series, um, uh, steps on, a, on a, uh, the head of, a, of a, the covering of a sprinkler and, and destroys his knee. And Yogi described, I mean, he saw 
a male being carried off the the uh, the field, and there was a, a shard of bone that was sticking out of his knee. That it was like Yogi saw a lot of things in a war that that just you know absolutely turned his stomach and made, you know weakened his knees. That's how that's how hard. I mean, and Mantle, who was the fastest player anyone had ever seen play baseball at that time. I mean, and he was still fast after, but he was never that good. And as we all know, you know, injury after injury after injury, we all know that he battled alcoholism. And uh, and, he, and we all know that he thought he was going to die by the time he was 36 because his father did and his two uncles did. And um, he just, um, the Yankee fans, he, he wasn't Joe DiMaggio, and they booed him and booed him, and he struck out a lot. And right, I mean, I think the worst season he had was 117 strikeouts. And wow, most players would grab that now. But, you know, striking out 100 times, uh, setting the record uh, as he did, that got a lot of boos. I mean, like I said, I mean, DiMaggio struck out 360 times. Yogi struck out 410 times in 17 years, on average less than 26 a year. And Nano was averaging 90 to 110 strikeouts a year. So he was just booed for his production. They thought he was going to be better than he was. And even 1956, when he won the Triple Crown with ridiculous stats. Um, not until Roger Maris came to the Yankees did the Yankee fans warm up to Mickey Mantle. It's unbelievable. Such a guy with such good production, and he never lived up to the hype that the Yankees put around him. And in the book, you mentioned how he would have a little bit of a hot temper where he would go into the dugout, he would be throwing things. And I related that to somebody I grew up watching in Paul O'Neill. That was just the correlation I was able to make. Yep, yep. Very, very you know, that, that's very similar. I mean, O'Neill would come off and, you know, kick the water cooler. I mean, Mantle was famous for coming in and slamming the bat into the bat rack and kicking. In fact, Yogi would, yeah, as a joke, Yogi um, got uh, some heavy um, uh, um, cardboard and he taped it around the water cooler. And he said, Nick, now when you kick it, you, you won't hurt your foot as much. And I mean, but that's, I mean, he really, he put a lot of pressure on himself um, to meet the expectations. Casey Stengel put a lot of pressure on him. You know, he, that was going to be, I mean, Joe McCarthy had Joe DiMaggio. Uh, Miller Huggins had Babe Ruth. This was going to be his Babe Ruth and his Joe DiMaggio. Mickey Mantle was a great, great player. Not as good as DiMaggio, not as good as Ruth, but how many players were? I mean, those are the two, two of the very best players, arguably the best players ever. Um, and that was just a lot of pressure that Casey put on him. Um, it's no surprise that he, you know, that he turned to, to drinking as much as he did. And that was a common thing in that Yankee clubhouse with a bunch of them that had the, the alcohol uh, issue, and it kind of affected their on-field performance. Kind of moving off the field, though, I want to talk about probably one of the most important people in Yogi's life, and that's his wife, Carmen. And in the book, it amazes me, and for the people that don't know, yearly basis, they negotiated their contract. So it wasn't like today where you see these big contracts right. being dished out. Really so, so every year, they had to negotiate. So Yogi would use Carmen kind of as his agent, and they would agree on terms to a contract, what they found suitable, uh, depending on how Yogi performed the year before. They were, they did everything together. And part of it, uh, certainly a big part of it was um, their business uh, career. And you know, you're talking about two depression babies here that, you know, knew food uncertainty, you know, lived in a world that you didn't know, you know, what next year was going to bring. Um, and, uh, and they both had a shrewd sense of what Yogi was worth. No, no agents in baseball, no free agency. The only recourse was to hold out. And uh, which Yogi did twice, um, and they were both big, big deals when he did it. And what they would do is they would sit down, Carmen and Yogi, and sit down at the kitchen table and decide, okay, what do I think I, I'm worth? What's the lowest? Because they knew they were going to get lowballed by George Weiss, who was a famous general general manager of the Yankees. Uh, what's the lowest I will take? And when they came up with those those two figures, Carmen uh, made Yogi um, uh, promise God that he wouldn't take lower than his lowest, uh, the lowest price they agreed on. And she knew that Yogi would never break a promise. Yogi was a, a religious guy. Um, and they wouldn't, once he made that promise, that was going to be it. And the Yankees found that out too. And, you know, he did not move off. So for two years, 50 and 51, 
both long celebrated holdouts and the Yankees gave in on both times. And after that, they just, you know, gave Yogi what he thought he was pretty much what he was thought he was worth. Yeah. The holdouts were amazing. And then I don't remember which year off the top of my head, but there was a year that they had everybody in camp ready to go signed because they didn't want to have any holdout issues. Well, you know, interesting. I mean, uh, Casey Stengel, you know, who became a legendary manager, had never gotten a team higher than first place and, you know, ends up winning seven World Series titles. And the only time in his tenure from 1949 to 1960, um, missed the World Series twice. Every other time he's in the World Series. So pretty successful. Um, but in 1960, they decided to make a change. Um, suddenly they came up with a rule, a uh, mandatory retirement rule. Um, at 65, and Casey was 70, and he had a great line. He goes, you know, well, when asked, you know, what he learned, he goes, well, I've learned never to be 70 again. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot of pressure now. This is a team that every year, even more than the George Steinbrenner era, which I lived through, and, you know, Steinbrenner expected to win every game. But the Yankees really were expected to win the World Series every year, basically because they did. And so they wanted to pave the way for um, Ralph Howe to succeed. So they made sure everybody was signed, signed early so that Howe had a happy, motivated team coming in right from the get-go. So it would be a great transition from a guy who was fired. The, the uh, mayor of New York wrote a letter that was put in the paper to Yankee managing management, hoping that, Yogi, that, that Casey would be back because they were rumors and they fired him. So they really wanted to make sure there was a nice, smooth transition to, um, uh, to, to Ralph Howe. So that's what they did for him. So now as Bear's star on the field begins to grow, he also starts taking advantage of the off the field opportunities and he gets involved in uh, multiple different things that start earning him money. Uh, talk about his off the field uh, endorsements in a way. Well, one of the things that I learned, I mean, I, like I said, I was born in 1952. I'm a, I'm a baby boomer. We're the first generation that, that grew up with television. Well, Yogi was a, was a baseball star as television was growing. I mean, you know, at the beginning of his career, was, baseball was barely on, on television because nobody had television sets. But television grew rapidly, and Yogi's career grew alongside of that. And one of the things that happens is that Yogi is on all of the variety shows, which were big. I mean, the Ed Sullivan show, the Jackie Gleason show, the Perry Como show. He's there, you know, waving to the crowd, doing a little interview with them. He's doing uh, guest spots on on uh, the Phil Silver show. Phil Silver's, you know, only people of, of my age will, re you know, and older will remember Phil Silver's, but he was a huge star, and he had a TV show where he, and Yogi played a, um, a Confederate officer uh, opposite of a very young Dick Van Dyke. Um, in 1962, um, an old uh, baseball player friend of his, Johnny Bernardino, also from St. Louis, um, had become a, an actor on, uh, on General Hospital, and, and Yogi literally played a brain surgeon on General Hospital. Um, he was on game shows. He did a ton of commercials where he made, you know, a lot of money with commercials. We all nowadays remember the Affleck duck commercial where he upstaged the duck and no one ever did that. And I, uh, I, I talked to the two guys who ran that campaign, who came up with it and ran that campaign for a long, long time. And they told me it was by far the most popular of the Affleck duck series of commercials. Um, and, you know, and going all the way back to 1962, where uh, Cutting Edge, he talked to a, uh, a talking cat to sell Puss in Boots uh, cat food. Um, so, you know, Yogi can do it all in terms of, of commercials, just like on the field. And, uh, and people, I asked advertising agents, uh, executives, what was it uh, about Yogi that made him so popular uh, to, the, to uh, advertisers? They said, um, people trusted Yogi. People liked him. I mean, that's advertising gold. So he, you know, really capitalized on, on his fame and his personality. Now, the, and of course, the Affleck commercial, I, I remember reading in the book, he tells Phil Rizzuto that the that the duck didn't actually talk, which I found <laughs> hilarious that he had to tell him that he doesn't talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, talk. he really doesn't talk. Um, I, I can see Yogi saying that, you know. I mean, Yogi, Yogi was a funny guy. Oh, absolutely. And as his playing career ends, 
he transitions to become a coach. But he kind of hits some hardships as he becomes the Yankees manager, especially given that he's in charge of managing guys that he grew up with throughout the system and were playing with for such a long time. You know, the interesting thing about that, he becomes the manager in 64 and without ever having any experience. He was a player coach in 63, and, and I didn't know this, um, that, they, that he, there was a secret deal um, between the Yankee management, Ralph Houck, and Yogi Berra, that Berra was going to be the manager in 64. They kept that secret from spring training of 63 until Yogi was named manager in October of 63 after they got swept by the Dodgers. Um, but uh, everyone thought that you know the Yankees were so good that you just put the team on the field and they're going to win, and that anyone can manage it. Yogi will learn on the job, and the uh, the big reason that they that they hired him. Um, besides the fact that other teams were talking to him about managing and they wanted to hold on to, to Yogi Berra, the most popular player in the franchise, um, was that the Mets um, in their two years had become, you know, sens- you know, sensations at the box office, abysmal on the field. But and of course, um, uh, Casey was uh, uh, wildly entertaining and they figured Yogi would, you know, would counter the Casey and, and, and the Mets popularity. Here's the Mets losing 100 games a year, and here's the Yankees being in the World Series every year, and there was about 100 to 150,000 uh, in attendance difference between the two teams. Um, so that was a big reason why they hired him. And uh, they did, Ralph Houck, as the general manager, did not do for Yogi what, what was done for him. There was a really important decision that was made, and that was Johnny Sane was the pitching coach, acknowledged as the best pitching coach in the game. And he wanted a, a raise of two thousand dollars a year uh, for two years, and how didn't give it to him. So, in, in what I think was really a fatal mistake, um, Yogi asked uh, first of all, not signing insane was ridiculous, and then he asked uh, uh, Yogi wanted Whitey to be a pitcher coach, and you know Whitey was a lot of things. He probably was good as you know giving tips and everything, but he was also a your star pitcher. And so he's going to be pitching every, every fourth day back in those days. And B was one of the guys that broke curfew all the time and, and was a real problem off the field for Yogi. Um, so making him, I, I think actually Yogi thought that making a coach would, would, would mitigate that and it didn't whatsoever. Um, so, you know, and, and how was, was not the mentor that, that the ownership had hoped for. And by August of 64, had convinced the owners that they, uh, that Yogi was in over his head, couldn't win the pennant, was already starting to talk to other managers on other teams to, to replace Yogi in August. Um, and then, of course, the Yankees come back, um, win the pennant, and go to the seventh game of the World Series without Whitey Ford available for the World Series. Um, and they, they lose 7-5 to five to Bob Gibson in the seventh game. And Yogi walks in thinking that, I'm going to ask for a two-year contract. And uh, walks in and they tell him he's fired. So, now, if, yeah. if it was today, how what percentage-wise would you think the, the hidden secret that Yogi was going to take over uh, would stay a secret? Like, do you think would... there's any chance? <laughs> I'll tell you what. I mean, you know, Yankees had a lot, always had a lot of media around them, but everything is relative. I mean, you know, you've been around the Yankees. There are there are dozens and dozens of reporters who find who follow that team every day. And now, you know, with the internet, on the radio, on television, um, people talking and digging and digging and digging. That would have been uh, really, really hard to keep that a secret in today's world. And you could make the case that Ford and, and Mantle, who were two of Yogi's best friends on the yeah. team, ended up being his downfall as a manager. Well, you know, the reason that the that, that Hal um, supposedly gave um, for, for uh, wanting to replace Yogi was that he couldn't control the team. Um, and one of the things that Hal did, um, which I, I thought was just a, a terrible misservice, was there were players who uh, Hal had dating back to his time as the minor league manager, um, coached them for, you know, managed them for three years, um, two World Series titles, three World Series appearances. Um, and they liked, you know, a certain group liked playing for, for Ralph, didn't like that Yogi didn't enforce the curfew for his friends, would go to complain to, to Hauk. And instead of uh, turning around and saying, listen, you got problems, 
go talk to your manager. I mean, if any, and if anyone should understand the chain of command, it's the guy who rose to be a major during the war, um, which was Ralph Howe, and instead undermined Yogi with his own team. Um, and so, yeah, it, uh, I don't think Yogi got the fairest shot in the world at, uh, and, and his best friends, you know, there were players, uh, there were people who wrote after the season that, you know, for, for guys who um, had money put in their pocket for the, all the clutch home runs that Yogi hit, they really didn't come through for him uh, when he needed them. And what he needed them was to set an example. And the example they set was not the one that they needed to set. So now Yogi goes on and he goes to coach with the Mets. He has a, a long time there, but he does end up returning to the Yankees and he does become the Yankees manager. And again, doesn't really go as uh, as planned for Yogi. Now, you know, I'll tell you what, one of the, one of the it's funny in, in my research, I mean, I knew he was with the Mets and I knew he managed the Mets. Um, I didn't realize how long he was with the Mets. He was with the Mets for 10 years. And, and in going through the research, I came upon a picture that just like really took me aback because it's a picture of Carmen um, sitting on Yogi's lap and they're both wearing Mets uniforms. And it's like, okay, this, this, you know, I see Yogi in pinstripes. I don't see him in the Mets uniform. I see him and his wife in Mets uniforms was, was, was jarring, you know, and with the Mets takes a team, uh, good pitching, very little hitting, Three games over 500, they beat a uh, historic team, the, the 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 big red machine, and and then they meet the the Oakland A's that, that were going to win three straight World Series, and they had uh, you know a roster full of the Reggie Jacksons and other Hall of Famers, um, and takes them to the seventh game, and in fact was up three games to two, um, and and pitched Seaver um, on three days rest when Seaver said yes, and he did a good job. They lost three to one. That that team couldn't hit. Um, he eventually comes back to the Yankees, uh, and this is George at his worst. This is George firing two and three managers a year, every year. This is George trading away half his team, you know, and replacing it with a different style team and second guessing everybody from game one um, of, the, of the season. And people, especially his wife, you know, tried very, very hard to talk Yogi out of taking that job. Um, when, when George finally asked him to take over in, in 83 for the 84 season. And, and sure enough, I mean, he, he took the job, did a good job, but the pressure of playing, of managing for George, got the Yogi and stopped smoking cigarettes, back to smoking cigarettes. Uh, his life was you know, made miserable by George. And George comes out, Yogi had a two-year contract. George comes out and announces, Yogi Berra will be the manager next year, which is interesting because, yeah, he had a contract <laughs> as the Yankees. Uh, this is not news, but for George it was. And he, and he promised Yogi um, privately and publicly that he would manage for the entire year. And he starts second-guessing him in, the, in spring training. And by the 10th game of, of the season, Yogi talks to Lou Pinello, who was then uh, first year as a coach, and said, look, if he's going to fire me, just get it over with already. This is just this is not any fun for anybody. And in the 16th game, uh, Clyde King was the general manager, flown to Chicago, and he fired him. And that's really what uh, it wasn't just the firing; it was how um, he was fired that uh, made Yogi uh, say, "I'll never go back to the Yankees as long as that man owns the team." Now, from from the book's perspective, while reading that part of it. It seemed obviously Yogi was upset by it, but I felt like Carmen was the driving point in Yogi's holdout from Yankee Stadium. Did you get that uh, inclination when you were yes. doing I mean, the I think there were there were other influences. I mean, when it happened, um, Dale, who had who had uh, the Yankees had traded for Dale Barrett, his youngest son from the Pirates, um, in the off season, and Yogi was really looking forward to to managing his son, and he only got to do it for sixteen games. Um, but he told the writers that day um, when he was fired, which created a, uh, a firestorm in the um, in the locker room. I mean, Don Baylor throwing trash cans, Don Manningly kicking things all over. I mean, people, the players were really upset that, that this had happened. And he told the writers that, hey, look, you know, I'll be around the stadium because I'm going to come back to watch Dale play. And I think that he goes home, he talks to his wife, and like I said, you know, they made all big decisions together. And, and I'm sure the conversation was, why would you ever go back 
when that guy is still in charge of the team after what he did to you. And John McMullen, who had been one of George's silent partners um, with the Yankees and had sold his small piece in the Yankees to become uh, owner of the Houston Astros and was a very dear friend, lived in Montclair with him, um, also gave him the same advice of, you know, just, just cut your ties. You know, and it actually offered him the managing job with the Astros, which Yogi turned down. And then when they named um, uh, Lanier to, to be manager, he came and asked Yogi to be the bench coach, um, which Yogi agreed to. And he coached for four years. And of course, the very first year of coaching, the Astros um, make it to the um, uh, playoffs and, and lose a classic series to, to the Mets. But I think that, you know, those that there were, you know, his wife and his close friends, um, you know, let him know that they thought that he shouldn't do it. And I think Yogi quickly agreed that I shouldn't go back as long as this guy managed the team. But I'll also tell you this, that after he finished coaching with the Astros, uh, Ron Guidry, who was a great help to this book, um, told me that Yogi told him those were the, those years away from baseball, those were the worst years of his life. Oh, I can, I can imagine, especially after you've lived so long with it around, Having it not in your life had to be a, a toll on Yogi, especially knowing his uh, personality. And you mentioned that we mentioned this whole uh, holdout. So years go by, and it seems like George Steinbrenner wants to patch things up. You could see that he's, I don't want to say he changed his ways, but I think he wants to make amends for something that he realizes was probably handled very wrong in the past and, and wants to bring Yogi back into the equation. Well, George didn't have to just think about it himself. He was reminded by the press constantly because with every old timers game that Yogi wasn't at, every um, retirement of the uniform that that he wasn't at, like Don Mattingly begged Yogi to come. Every you know thing like Phil Rizzuto and anniversary of fifty years with the team that Yogi didn't go to, and Phil Rizzuto was his closest friend. Um, every time these things happened, it was just you know, brought up again and again. And I think in the last 10, 15 years of George's life that, you know, George wasn't a dumb man. He knew he made a lot of mistakes and, and he knew that this one was a big one. Um, and I think it was sincere. And Susan Waldman deserves a lot of the credit. She had a great relationship with, with George. And she went to George and said, look, um, I know you want Yogi back. You're going to have to apologize. And you're going to have to apologize on his turf which at that point now was the Yogi Berra Museum. That was a beautiful little museum that's in Montclair. I'm sure you've been there and it's, it's a great place. And you're gonna have to go there. And eventually she got George to agree. And then it was Yogi who didn't want to do it. And because he thought this was gonna be just another George, you know, oh, I don't trust that guy. He's just trying to show me up. I'm not gonna do this. And um, Rose Kelly, who was the, the, the driving force behind building that museum, a friend of the Berra's and a leading citizen of Montclair, and her husband, John, who was a good friend to Yogi, they, they had lockers together in the, in the, in the golf club that they, they were members of. They, they were the ones who, who brought this to Yogi, along with Dave Kaplan, and they were all, the three of them were shocked at the anger, uh, because they, they, you rarely saw Yogi get anger, that, that just a suggestion that he do this raised. And he went to the office where, where his kids had the memorabilia um, business and Dale and Tim, and, and they basically pitched the story that I think lots of people have heard that, look, it's very true. Your, your grandchildren have never seen you in Yankee Stadium. You have 11 grandchildren. Don't you want, don't you want them to see that? And so he finally agreed. And once George came, not in his power suit, which everyone knows, you know, the, the blue blazer and the white turtleneck <laughs> and the whole thing. He came in a very subdued camel colored jacket and a brown turtleneck shirt. And he apologized to Yogi. And once he did that, they became friends. And they had a sincere friendship. Called each other on their birthdays. He would sit in George's box um, during uh, homestands, not to pal around with all the stars that used to like to be seen in George's box, but because he liked uh, being at the games and, and he watched the games there. And they were to the day that George died when they held a, a press conference at the Yogi Berra Museum that day, um, a, a really warm and sincere friendship developed between those. Yogi, you know, could hold a grudge, but once it was over, it was over. Yeah. I'm personally happy that they, that they made amends because as a younger generation Yankee fan, 
I got to witness Yogi come back. So I really don't remember the years where he was away from the team, but I do remember when he did come back uh, and he was well welcomed by the uh, Yankee Stadium faithful. But the one day I want to talk about in regards to Yogi was Yogi Berra Day. And right. I remember this day because David Cohn was one of my favorite pitchers growing up. History was made that day, and it was just fitting that it happened on such a special day for Yogi. Really, really an amazing story. And the, the people at the museum, Rose, uh, who directed the museum during uh, at that during that year, um, came up with an idea to um, take about a hundred people from um, from the Montclair area and take the ferry around um, to the to the stadium. Um, so uh, it was also used as a fundraiser for the for the museum, which is a nonprofit. And I think it still only costs about six dollars when we finally reopen to go and see a, a piece of history. And uh, and they go to the game, and it's a really hot day. And Yogi's sitting in his box with his family, and and Don Lawson, who became a good friend after their perfect game together, is in uh, in George's box, and just happened to be there that day. And you know, there were people in in Yogi's box. I mean, all his grandkids were there, and say, so, you know, you know, do you want like in the sixth inning? Do you want to leave? And 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 Yogi, who was famous for leaving in around the sixth inning to beat the traffic when when he went to games, I said, uh, not this game. And, you know, uh, he was thinking right along with, with Cohn about how to get every hitter out, you know, and how he had gotten them out uh, during during that game. And it was against the, the Montreal Expos, who had a, a bunch of good young hitters on that team. And, um, you know, one of the amazing things was Cohn. I mean, Yogi's, everyone knows Yogi's number was eight. Cohn, Cohn threw 88 pitches that day. And, um, and David, who I interviewed for this book as well as for my first book, and I've known him for, for a long time now, um, just was, you know, he loved Yogi, as mo most of the, pl all the players did. Um, to be able to do that and give Yogi that kind of gift on his on his day was something that, you know, Cohn said, you know, I'll remember all my life for what I was able to do for Yogi. And that's how that's how the players felt about it. And that interaction he had with Don Larson before the game, that's a, that's a comical story as well, where he tells Larson, oh, you're going to jump into Yogi's arms? And Larson yeah. looks at him and tells him, no, it's the opposite way, kid. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they threw, you know, it was interesting, too, part of that story. I mean, what happened was, you know, Larson pitched through the, the ceremonial first pitch, threw the pitch to Yogi and um, and uh, combed through to Girardi. And um, Girardi asked Yogi, you know, the, the mitts were smaller in Yogi's day, and, and asked Yogi if he wanted to... Um, him, you know, wanted to get a smaller mitt. I got a smaller mitt in my in my locker, and Yogi said, "No, no, no that's fine." And Joe looks at him and says, "Well, can you do me a favor? Can you bless this mitt?" So he did, and that was the mitt, of course, that Gary uh, that uh, Girardi wore for the perfect game, and so something Girardi, who spent a, a, a good couple of hours with me in spring training, um, told some terrific stories about uh, about Yogi and. and uh, you know, that one was really special to him. Now, Yogi becomes a, a spring training instructor because obviously, knowing Yogi, he couldn't stay away from the game. But he builds a, a very good relationship with Ron Guidry because, as in the book, Joe Torrey, who was the manager at the time, told Guidry, your responsibility is to take care of Yogi. But there's one story that you bring up, and I want you to talk about it, is the frog's legs. Oh, okay. All right. So, Yogi is a man of habit. I mean, if, if he did something, it would be, he would always do that. If he got up at a certain time, that's the time he got up. If he went to dinner with you, like Gridry said, you know what, my job, you know, was to pick up Yogi and it was an honor to do that. And then, you know, we went to these restaurants. Um, every, every spring training, it was the same five restaurants ordering the same dish. Yogi was just a man of habit. And, and Gidry, one of the things Gidry liked to do was he came down with like, six or seven or eight dozen frog's legs. You know, he's from Cajun country in, in Louisiana and he would fry up um, with his own special sauce. And Mel Stolomeyer loved them and Bruce Gossage loved them um, and a couple of other players, Willie Randolph. Um, but Yogi, you know, kept turning up his nose. And so finally, after like the third year of this, he goes, he goes, you know, yo, if, if you don't at least try these, um, we're not going out to dinner tonight and you're eating alone in your room. So Yogi goes, all right, all right, and he takes one and he bites into it. And he takes another bite, and then he he looks around and he just 
puts his hand into the thing, grabs five more frog legs, puts them on his plate, finishes the frog legs, and he says to Gidry, he goes, um, got any more of these? He goes, no, that was it. We're all out. You're going to have to wait till next year. And then that became the habit, is, uh, was frog legs. He discovered that he loved frog legs. That's great that Gidry was able to get him out of habit. Yep. Well, other than what we talked about, were there any stories or anything that stood out to you while doing the research that was surprising to you about Yogi that you didn't know already? Well, you know, one of the things, um, I mean, a couple of small things um, first, and then I'll, I'll tell you the, the big one. A couple of small things like we talked about he was a natural right-handed hitter and, and became one of the great left-handed hitters in, in all of baseball. That amazed me. Um, every I th- People of my age remember the famous um, fight at the Copa um, where the Yankees, uh, Mickey Mantle, Billy Martin, Whitey Ford, Yogi, Luke Scarron, Hank Bauer got into a fight with a bunch of guys from a bowling league um, late at night at the Copert, which they all got fined. Um, and they, you know, and that was a constant uh, thing in, in stories the rest of the year. Like if the Yankees had hit as hard as they hit at the Copert that night, they would have won this game easily. Um, and Yogi was embarrassed by this and he didn't want to go. He, had, he was off to a slow, slow start. It was 1957. And this is uh, this is for um, uh, Billy Martin's birthday, so I think it was May tenth. Uh, and uh, Carmen uh, talked him into it. And Carmen felt so bad for so many years that if Yogi, you know, um, if he if she had listened to Yogi, he would have been home sleeping that night and not been associated with you know a scandal in baseball. Um, the uh, he was the, the big thing that I think is that. You know, on the field, Yogi was famous for being chatty. I mean, he talked to the players at bat, talked to the umpires. Um, you know, when they moved him to the outfield, he was like, oh, you know, now I can't get to talk to anybody. I take the player on the field. Um, but off the field was um, quiet and, and almost to the point of being shy. And so there really was two different Yogis, whether it was on the baseball field he was one way and off the baseball field. He was a, a very different um, persona. And that really surprised me a lot. That is really interesting. But now, as you did all this research and spent all these years working on the book, how would you define Yogi Berra's legacy? Oh, I'll tell you, great, great baseball player without question. Better than, than people understand. Um, and an even better person. And and that's that's a hard thing, you know. Not a man without faults. Everybody has faults, but you could tell by the way he was embraced by everybody and how he just, you know, when he walked in, you know, I was talking to Michael Kay yesterday and, and he told a story about being at Yankee Stadium on Paul O'Neill Day. And this was like, you know, great day for Paul O'Neill, who was a, you know, of those, that era Yankees, you know, a much beloved Yankee. And, you know, and, and Paul was the center of attention and, uh, you know, one of the best days of his life. And suddenly the door to the, to the uh, suite opens up and um, Yogi is in a wheelchair. Um, I think he's like 89 at the time and rolled in and uh, O'Neill tears come through his eyes that he's so happy that Yogi came to his day. And that kind of tells you how everyone felt about Yogi Berra. And that museum really is a testament to the, to the two sides. I mean, part of it was the guy is a great baseball player, and it's in its, in its history what he did. Um, but off the field, he was just as good. And it's not, you know, you can't say it about, about too many people. And I'll end it this way. You know, when uh, he got the, unfortunately, he didn't live to see um, uh, Obama present his son instead of him with the Medal of Freedom. And when they gave the list to Obama, President Obama, uh, you know, the one thing he said, he stopped when he got the Yogi's name. And, and he said, and he looks up and I said, you know, my only question is why was, you know, why wasn't he in sooner? I mean, I thought he was already had this medal. I mean, that's the way people looked at him. And I think that's his legacy. Such a high regard for such a, a well-known and, and distinguished individual. And I have to tell you, this has been a, an honor to talk to you about the book. It was a great, oh, my pleasure. it was absolutely riveting to read the book. And, and especially during these times where, uh, the world is faced with so much crisis and people are in quarantine. It, it really added a different perspective. And I, I encourage everybody to go out and read the book. 
I want you to go through where they could get the book because I understand that the book is a very hot seller at this point. Well, I'll tell you the um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for for the high praise and. I miss baseball terribly. It's always been a, uh, a big part of my life, and, and it's always on and is a void right now. And who knew that, that I was going to put out a book um, into this? And, you know, I think that, you know, for a baseball fan, I'm hoping that they can, you know, kind of lose themselves in baseball. And, and you know, we here in the tri-state area um, know that this is this is not a hoax. This is, this is, this is a serious thing. And... Um, and there's a lot of pain out there and, and a lot of nervousness. So I'm, I'm hoping I can, you know, that this will help, you know, give people some, some pleasure for, for a while. Um, Amazon uh, sold out of it on the first day. Um, I think that's a testament to, to popularity of Yogi. And, um, and, you know, priorities being what they are, it's been tough for them to get the book back in with all the other things that they're trying to get in and, and sell. So right now, Barnes & Noble is, just about is sold out of Walmart and Target, so I think BarnesandNoble.com uh, is is the place to go if you want to get and read about someone who's really special. So you heard it here, Yogi, a life behind the mask. Check it out. Go to BarnesandNoble.com to find the book. Once again, John Pesha joining us on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today, and best of luck with the book. Thanks, Nick. It's been a pleasure to talk about this.